Think Forward, Think Research Channel. I'm Deanna Connell and welcome to Oregon State University's Research Frontiers. I'm visiting the OSU Hatfield Marine Science Center in the coastal community of Newport, Oregon, where researchers, government agencies, and private industries have forged a unique working relationship. They've combined marine science, education, and outreach, and it's having a global impact. We'll take you to the lab where researchers learn pearls of wisdom in their quest to breed a better oyster. Plus, with the help of a world-renowned OSU marine mammal researcher, blue whales are making a comeback. But first, we begin with scientists who have an ear on the ocean floor. They're listening for earthquakes using top secret government surveillance equipment. And what they're finding is giving the ocean science community plenty to talk about. Bob, from your laboratory here at the Hatfield Marine Science Center, you use acoustic techniques to hunt for volcanoes. How does this work? Uh, that's correct. We use um, hydrophones, which are essentially underwater microphones, to detect uh, the sound energy that earthquakes on the seafloor project up into the water column. And this, uh, these microphones, hydrophones, were given to you by the U.S. Navy. That's correct. Uh, yes, at the end of the, the Cold War, in the late 80s, uh, the U.S. Navy was looking for applications for their military assets mm -hmm. and one of these was the SOSIS sound surveillance system or SOSIS hydrophone arrays in the North Pacific and my group here at NOAA approached them about using them for civilian research. Mm -hmm. uh, they agreed and in 1991 we uh, established a uh, acquisition system up at the Whidbey Island Naval Air Station mm -hmm. in which we bring their data via encrypted phone line down to our lab in real time. It's still high, highly secret though, why is that? It is classified um, because there can be, um, the, the hydrophone system was initially used for anti-submarine warfare okay. and the Navy likes to keep this uh, system uh, usable for those applications. So but by giving us an unclassified subset, they have do environmental research and support civilian research as well as maintain their mission. How many earthquakes have you picked up using the system? Well normally in, a, in an average year we see thousands, several thousand earthquakes from the Juan de Fuca Ridge. All of very small, moderate magnitudes from magnitude two up to magnitude six. Um, every two to three years or so, a very intense earthquake swarm occurs where we'll see, oh, 10,000 earthquakes in a week. And generally that's associated with uh, a seafloor eruption. Uh, injection of magma from the mantle through the crust and then a subsequent eruption of lava onto the seafloor. And this uh, equipment is pretty fascinating. It uses sound channels. How does that work? That's correct. In, in the oceans, uh, there is a, a low velocity zone called the sound channel. It's about a thousand meters deep. It's a pressure, temperature, salinity effect. And the sound channel acts like a waveguide. It uh, allows very weak signals or sound energy to propagate over long distances with very little loss in energy. So essentially like having a fiber optic cable in the oceans for us to tap into. And it's using the system that's the real advantage of uh, using hydrophones, or using the sound channels, you really advantage of using hydrophones. Because land-based seismic networks, uh, they can detect earthquakes, of course, from the seafloor, but they have to be very large. Whereas with the hydrophones, we detect very small earthquakes, can detect very small earthquakes, which allows us to get a very complete picture of the dynamics of the, of the system, of the eruption as they're ongoing, uh, and how this, all, how this all interrelates. You are able to uh, create portable hydrophones. Tell me how you did this. Yes, um, based on the success of using these uh, Navy hydrophones, um, we saw that we needed to be able to transport them uh, throughout the global oceans. Uh, the Navy hydrophones are fixed and cannot be moved. Mm -hmm. So uh, our engineering staff here in Haru Matsumoto, he developed a portable SOSIS, if you want to call it, portable hydrophone system. And it's essentially just a listening device uh, on top, attached to a six-foot pressure case that is powered by about 50 D-cell batteries. 
uh, we can take that on an oceanographic vessel and deploy it uh, anywhere in the global oceans. Uh, we anchor the hydrophone to the seafloor and use a float to suspend it into the sound channel, the, the, you know, the, the wave, wave guide in the oceans. And then we have been able then to deploy them in different ridge systems, volcanic areas mm -hmm. um, throughout the world, focusing mostly on the East Pacific, Mid-Atlantic, and, um, and now we're starting a new project in Antarctica. From his lab just down the hall, Haru Matsumoto, an OSU research associate, is taking portable hydrophones to the next level. Well, those are, all the one is a moored hydrophone, uh, which means that it is tethered from the, all the way from the bottom and then suspended by the float. This one uh, moves by itself. There's no tether. We just throw away from the side of the ship and uh, tell what depths it wants to go, it should go to the, uh, to the bottom. And it uh, goes all the way to the bottom and stay there for a long period of time, up to maybe a month or so. And then when it becomes, when the data buffer becomes full, comes up the surface and then broadcasts the data. So um, it's, I think in a sense, it is much more intelligent. This is one behind you? Yes. It looks so simple, really. Tell me about it. Well, this we call Q phone, which is uh, basically um, real-time hydrophone. Okay. And uh, uh, what it does is uh, it's a basically a small submersible and it has a small bladder, oil-filled bladder. Mm -hmm. And it's all by its own power, it goes up and down the water column, uh, and with the, uh, with the up to the depths of 2,000 meters of water depths, and uh, it it can goes up and down many times. And it, this instrument itself lasts about a year or so. And uh, when it is when it reaches the bottom, what it does is listen to the sound, record the sound, and detect any hydroacoustic signal. Typically, what we want to hear is uh, a seismic signal. Mm -hmm. And then uh, if, when it, it uh, collects enough data, it goes up to the surface and then broadcasts the data through satellite. And then we, list, uh, we just gather the data here in the lab laboratory instead of uh, going out the ocean and uh, analyze the data. And then we can locate the, the, the source of the uh, seismic a signal. Will you ever get to the point where you'll be able to get the information at real time once it happens? It can uh, rise to the surface, send out a signal, and you might find out a minute later or seconds later that there's volcanic activity? We will know, you know, when or where the earthquake happened in the ocean uh, much closer uh, in real time. It's not going to be exactly real time. There will be a time delay because uh, it takes time for this uh, vertical flow to come up to the surface about several hours. So there's a certain time delay, but we would know much faster than the uh, deployed hydrophone we have been using last uh, decade or so. Because you had to wait six months for that information That's at times. correct, yeah. We have to send a ship uh, for one year uh, uh, and to deploy the hydrophone, more the hydrophone, and then uh, about a year later, uh, we sent ship again to recover the hydrophone, and then we have to wait another six months to process the data. So about a year and six months of time delay there. With this um, real time, near, near real-time hydrophone, we probably have to wait maybe a day or uh, six hours, depending on how fast this uh, float can go up and down the water column. Without that fast turnaround, volcanologist Bill Chadwick might have missed several rare opportunities to study hydrothermal vents. Bill, how many active underwater volcanoes have you responded to? Uh, well, there have been three times when the, the hydrophone group uh, heard a bunch of earthquakes out on the ridge and we went out and, to see what was happening and we found that uh, lava had actually erupted on the seafloor. What is it like to witness an underwater volcano? Uh, well, it's really exciting. Uh, most of the time, when by the time we get there, everything's over, but um, we map out where the new lava came out and we see uh, where there's new hot springs on the seafloor and, and where the life is going to be coming back into the area in the years uh, after the eruption. And why are the microbes in these thermal vents or coming out of them of such great interest to you? Well, they're really fascinating for a number of reasons. Uh, one is that um, 
a lot of scientists think that life on Earth may have started in this environment deep in the ocean at these hydrothermal vents. Another thing is uh, the hydrothermal vent animals and the microbes are completely different than um, a lot of the life that we see up on, on land. Um, they're really different because they're, they don't depend on sunlight. They're completely independent of photosynthesis and they actually make energy from the chemicals coming out of the hot spring water. So they're really interesting. Fascinating. <clears throat> and this is a piece of equipment that you use to monitor some of the underwater earthquakes. How does this work? Right, this is basically an instrument that uh, we put down to try and monitor what's happening at uh, volcanoes underwater. And uh, this particular one measures vertical movements of the seafloor. And uh, it has quite a story to tell because it was actually caught in a lava flow that uh, erupted in 1998. And that is a, an area that you've been studying or you are launching a long-term study. It is in the Juan de Fuca. Why did you choose right. that area and what have you learned? Um, well, this particular volcano we thought was uh, particularly active and probably the most likely place where we'd see something, and, and uh, that was a good guess because uh, it erupted in, in 1998. We had uh, uh, some instruments down there already, and this one actually got lifted up uh, in the lava flow and got, went along for a ride for a couple hours and then got set back down and it recorded all that data and so that was a, a fascinating story to learn about. Bill, what is next for your research team? We're coming up with new ways of monitoring volcanic activity on the seafloor and we're also monitoring in new places. So we're, we're working in the Western Pacific and uh, at volcanoes that are shallower in the ocean and have more interaction with the life in the upper ocean and um, have a very different ac kind of activity. So we're we're looking in the same places in new ways, and we're looking in new places also. Seafloor seismologist Bob Ziak and his team know there is much more to learn about how hydrothermal vents impact the temperature and chemistry of the ocean, and what effect those changes may have on physical oceanographic processes and even our climate. But a recent eruption taught them to expect the unexpected and won them a top 100 scientific discovery. Tell me about the award um, that you received. In 2001, we detected a, another large earthquake swarm concentrated on the ridge. Uh, this earthquake swarm migrated along the ridge and came to st and stopped right at a, a hole that was drilled in the, in the sediment and crust, uh, deep into the crust. So we presumed when we went out that there would be this big lava flow coming out of the hole or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. uh, and as it turned out, we to the, you know, my colleagues surveyed the area and, and there was no evidence of an eruption. But what was in the hole was a sensor, sensor that detects water pressure. And it, it saw that the, this, the water had been flowing into the hole and acting, um, you know, like being neg negative pressure transient, we call it. But mm -hmm. basically the whole water is being sucked into the hole. So essentially what had happened, I think, is that the crust had stretched like a sponge, opening up big holes uh, you know, big, opening big pore holes and allowing the water to flow in. So essentially, rather than having a plume that we it would occur during an eruption, we had an anti-plume occur when it was bringing water into the into the crust. How has this been important for your research? Oh well, it's just you know it's learning how the system works. That's what we're doing. You know, we, we just when we begin to think we have it figured out that yes, these storms occur and eruption happens. Uh -huh. uh, so we go out and we find that, no, you know, that doesn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> so we're getting to see how the whole dynamic process occurs as linked. And as we study the ridge, that will give us some idea of how the subduction zone uh -huh. occurs, and then maybe that will give us an idea of how the, the Cascade volcanoes, how their activity is linked. It's just all one big system, and, and we're just trying to understand our part of it. I'm here today with Chris Langdon. He is a professor of fisheries at Oregon State University. Thanks for joining us, Chris. My oh, pleasure. The research you're doing to improve the brood stock of the Pacific oyster is the first of its kind. So why oysters? Well, oysters have been farmed on the west coast here for about 100 years. And uh, it's quite a big industry. It's worth about 60 to $70 million. And a lot of people in the coastal communities here earn living from oysters. And um, despite the fact that it's been farmed for such a long time, uh, there hasn't been any attempt up to very recently to improve the performance of these Pacific oysters. And so what we're doing here at the Hatfield Center is trying to 
improve the yields of Pacific oysters through traditional uh, selective breeding programs. The twist is that we're using modern molecular techniques in combination with these traditional methods to uh, pedigree the families and to also to try and understand a little bit about the genetics of the animal and how individual genes affect the performance of the animals. Looking at an oyster, it's hard for me to tell which might be better than another. Yeah. But you actually select for certain traits, and what are those traits you look for? Well, we did a survey in uh, 1995 of the industry and tried to find out what they wanted. And uh, by far the most important trait that they were interested in was yield. So that is the, sort of the weight of oysters per bag. Mm -hmm. And uh, over the uh, sort of 10 years we've been working on this, we've been e able to improve yields considerably. So we're now about 40% higher than the uh, yields from unselected broodstock. And industry is very interested now, of course, and uh, they're using our, our broodstock in their hatcheries. But very recently, in the last year or so, um, industry is starting to now focus on the appearance of the individual oyster, because there's a lot, a lot more people in this country uh, eating oysters on the half shell. And so the appearance of the oyster, its color, and the shell shape are becoming much more important. So I've got some oysters here, and I can just pull a couple out if you like. That would be to show great. You. That would be great. Yeah. And you divide them by families, yes. right? Yes. Each of these bags uh, represents a separate family, and um, you can see here these are two oysters from two different families, mm -hmm. and you can see the difference here in the in the shape and the color of and the, the shells as well. and the markings. And uh, we haven't yet done any uh, market analysis to find out you know, which oyster type of oyster consumers like. Uh -huh. But a um, you know, consumer might have a preference for this oyster here that has a wonderful sort of reddish color uh -huh. versus this one that is, is more white. We just don't know at the moment. So that's going to be the next step um, to try and find out what consumers really like to eat, what is most appear appealing to them, and then to try and select for those particular uh, traits. Chris, the operation you have going here is really impressive. You do everything yourself from the larval culture to growing the food the oysters need. Right. Can you take me through this process step by step? Yes. It's a, it's a quite a complicated process because these animals have several different life stages. The first step then is to spawn the oysters and uh, fertilize the eggs and then raise these larvae for two to three weeks in our hatchery and feed them on microalgae. And then after a period of time, what they'll do is they'll go through what's called metamorphosis. So the larvae will lose their swimming organ, which is a velum, and settle to the bottom of our tank. And they'll, in nature, what they do is they look for a substrate to attach to. And they'll attach to a piece of shell or a rock or something like that. What we do is we short circuit that and just as they're ready to set, we give them a dose of, of adrenaline, basically. It's a chemical we add, uh, and that speeds them up to such an extent that they don't bother to attach to a substrate. They actually go through metamorphosis without setting to a sub piece of substrate. And that's an advantage, because then we can end up with single oysters, just like the, these ones I've showed you here and um, we can work with those single animals more easily than if they were attached to a, a piece of shell. So once they've gone through metamorphosis, uh, what we do then is we raise them as baby oysters, which are called spat. And they start off as uh, tiny little animals that are probably no bigger than the size of uh, a sand grain. And then over a period of about two months, we, we raise them in these upwellers, we feed them on algae, until they're about three to five millimeters in size. And then at that time, we put them in bags and we plant them out at test sites all up and down the coast. And the oysters don't willingly uh, give up their eggs. No. You. Tell me about yeah. that process. Yeah, well, that, that's a, a process that involves some coaxing. Um, and what we do is we bring broodstock in uh, and we condition them. So we fool them into thinking that it's midsummer and ready to spawn naturally. And so this involves warming them up, keeping them in 18 degree water for a month or two, and feeding them lots of food. And so after that period of conditioning, what we can do is we can go in and then we can take the individual oysters and open them up 
and they're ripe. And then we can remove the eggs and sperm and fertilize the eggs in a, in a, in a beaker. And you crossbreed the best families? Yes. You put the best yes. families together. Yes. So every, every time we go out and harvest a cohort, um, we select the top um, maybe five to ten families in that cohort. And then we use that, those five to ten families, top performing families, uh, to produce our next generation. Tell me how you incorporate local oyster farmers into your research. Yeah, well that's a very good question and, and this program wouldn't exist if we didn't have a lot of support from the oyster farming community. And not only um, do they host the sites, so they provide you know, grounds for us to use to plant our 600 bags, which is quite a lot of space, um, but they uh, provide us with uh, help as well. So, and they'll look after the bags and check them, make sure they don't get washed away, and call us if there's a major problem. <laughs> when will they be able to use the research? Uh, uh, they already are. On? Oh, they are? Yeah, they yeah. Are. so the hatchery is already using our broodstock and uh, the feedback we're getting is pretty good. Um, we've done some large-scale experiments where we really wanted to see whether you know, we can produce millions and millions and millions of animals that perform better on a huge industrial scale where we plant acres of land. And we've done that on uh, one occasion already and sure enough, you know, what we see in our small bags translates to what we see in these acre plots and that uh, the performance, the yield of uh, animals, not only in terms of their overall shell weight, but their meat weights is about, was about 20% better than wow. from non-selected, traditionally used industry foodstock. Mm -hmm. So that was, you know, I think of all the research we've done, all the results we've produced, that was actually, for the industry, mm -hmm. the real telltale result that they were looking for. Does it work on a big uh -huh. scale? Because, you know, a lot of experiments don't transfer right. to industry. The Northwest oyster industry is benefiting from the effort to breed a better oyster. But it's the discovery and protection of breeding grounds of one of the world's most endangered species that's the focus of whale researcher Bruce Mate's life work. Coming up, 12.30. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Bruce, blue whales are the largest creatures on Earth, and yet there's still so much we don't know about them. Why is that? Well, they're really rare, actually. When you look at the size of the ocean and how few there are, it's a dilution process. And they live 95% of their time underwater, so even when they come to the surface, it's only a very brief period of time. And we basically are surface creatures, so we just don't get that much contact with them. It also happens that they live farther offshore than many of the other species, so we don't see them nearly as often from shore. How many blue whales are alive today? Worldwide, we're looking at a population of about eight to 10,000 whales, which is only about 8% of what there used to be. But we're blessed to have about a fourth of those whales along the Oregon, California coast during the summer months feeding. So this is the largest concentration of blue whales anywhere in the entire world. How can learning about the habitat behavior and movement of the blue whale ultimately save the species? Well, the most important thing is the critical habitats that they use, the places where they breed, feed, calve, and migrate, are considered in any human developments, um, whether it be shipping, oil production, fisheries, that we have these species in mind as we go into areas that are important to them. And remarkably, most of these areas are not identified for most of the endangered species in the world. So the primary thing to do is find out where they go, and we use tags for that. We tag them in the areas we know, and they take them, us to other seasons of the year that we don't know, connecting the reproductive part with the feeding part, or vice versa. And so by connecting all of this, we get a full sense of what their habitat utilization is and what their needs are. That's the key to conservation. One, we can know where they are. Two, we know how many and three, we can protect the areas they need in order to reproduce and thrive. Bruce, how do you get developing countries on board uh, with your goal to help save the blue whales? Well, I think it's everybody's goal. There's actually, I've never seen any resistance to helping endangered species, actually. Um, so the real key is that they don't have the resources 
uh, in terms of money or, or equipment at times. So we will go and help them. We'll bring resources. We'll involve local students or have them come here. And in that process, then the information becomes theirs. And it's how they use the information that's going to be the effective part of improving the future of these animals in the first place. I want to talk a little bit about your personal connection to the blue whale. You've come pretty close to at least one or a few of these, right? Yes, of the animals we tag, we're usually within 10 feet of the animals. So wow. we're closer than most people ever, ever get, even by happenstance, and we do that quite regularly. We've been able to see a lot of how uh, the animals are intimate with their calves and yearlings. Um, there are aspects of being close to such a large animal that are sort of unforgettable. I've seen a 20-foot wave that you could look into the face of the wave and see 20 feet of a whale's head, a blue whale coming at you, basically surfing, probably for fun. They don't <laughs> feed in that circumstance. Surfing? You really think the whale is surfing, huh? Sure. Why not? Ah. We see seals and sea lions and dolphins do it all the time. Uh -huh. and, um, uh -huh. But to see something that large coming through the face of a wave and recognizing what you don't see is the length of a greyhound bus is pretty remarkable. Bruce, through your research, you've tagged 129 blue whales in just 10 years. What's next for your research with blue whales? Well, for blue whales, we'll be concentrating on the population off California a bit more to learn about dive habits. Then we're going to take that information that we learn and we're going to use it throughout the southern hemisphere where there are many blue whale populations that have not been studied at all yet. We'll be working in the South Pacific, South Atlantic, and the Indian Oceans and we hope in the future, at least within a decade, to be able to do some very significant work around the Antarctic. There was a time when we thought blue whales could be lost forever. Is that still true? No, fortunately that was a pretty pessimistic view in the 60s that there may be so few that they couldn't even find each other to reproduce. Now we're learning that there are pockets of blue whales around the world and with adequate protection of habitats, I'm pretty confident that we're going to see many of these populations recover fully. You mentioned it would be a sad day if, if your grandchildren could never see a blue whale. It would. In fact, I'd like to think that there won't ever be a time when children, adults, couldn't go and just be awestruck by the largest animal that's ever lived on Earth. Bruce Mate is both passionate and creative when it comes to conducting research that could save his beloved blue whales. For the right price, he'll even name a whale after you so you can follow its migration and keep tabs on it, just like Bruce does. So they've got undersea earthquake studies, oyster breeding, and whale tracking happening here at the OSU Hatfield Marine Science Center. Pretty diverse fields of study. And there is so much more coming out of this research institution on the Oregon coast. Here to talk a little more about it is George Bullert. He is the director of the Hatfield Marine Science Center. George, thanks for taking the time to talk with us. Tell us what else is happening here. Sure, Deanna. At the Hatfield Marine Science Center, we have a diversity of research in Oregon State University. It combines faculty research along with that of graduate students and a variety of undergraduate programs as well, in addition to our education programs. We have chemical oceanography, uh, various types of biological oceanography, and one of the things we're really well known for here that's unique in the United States is the degree of partnerships that we have. We have a variety of federal agencies and state agencies who are on site as well as other cooperating universities that come here to conduct research in some of the unique facilities that we have at this location. So how did these unique cooperative partnerships come about, George? Well, they came about through the proximity to the ocean, to the facility that Oregon State initiated here, and to real needs in applied marine science that the agencies can work closely with academics to address problems that are very difficult to address in other locations. Any new partnerships you're working on? Well, just recently we formulated a, a memorandum of understanding with the Oregon Coast Aquarium, which is just a little bit to the south of us here. Uh, this is a public serving institution that goes along for outreach with our visitor center here at the Oregon State University Hatfield Marine Science Center. So this is uh, an area where we see uh, really great potential in the future for cooperation both in education and research. George, thanks so much for sharing more about these unique partnerships. They have resulted in some groundbreaking research. Great, thank you. 
Glad you could join us today for OSU's Research Frontiers. If you'd like to learn more about any of the research you saw today or other exciting things happening at Oregon State University, just head to our website. We'll see you next time.